In this tutorial, we're going to look at the origins of the universe. The first aim is to compare the Big Bang and steady state theory, then describe the evidence supporting each theory, and finally explain how scientists use spectrometry to learn about the universe. Now, one thing I really love about science is the deeper you understand something, the far more complex it becomes. Science is one of those subjects where you can't just simply answer a question and hope that's the end of it. Solving one mystery inevitably leads to more questions. Our developing understanding of the universe is an excellent example of this. For instance, take light. In the 1600s, Isaac Newton realised that if you shine sunlight, what we call white light, through a prism, a prism is a glass object with unparalleled sides, a bit like a raindrop, you actually realise that light is composed of several colours mixed together. We call this range of colours the spectrum, which is derived from the Latin word for apparition or phantom. Now obviously people had seen rainbows before this time, but Newton was the first person to truly understand how to separate light. So naturally, your question you may ask is why do they separate out? Well basically different colours of light have different wavelengths and when they travel through a prism they slow down at different rates. This causes them to bend unequal amounts. Having unparalleled sides only exaggerates this separation of these different wavelengths so you can see them. However, Newton missed out on hitting gold with his discovery. About 150 odd years later, a scientist known as Joseph von Fraunhofer discovered something truly fascinating. He too split light using a prism, but then he went one step further and observed that light using a diffraction grating, something we call a spectroscope. A diffraction grating forces light to move through very, very, very narrow spaces, causing it to split or diffract. When he did this, he noticed something startling. He realised that the spectrum wasn't continuous, but rather broken. There were pieces missing. There were these thin black lines where no light appeared to be. Almost like there was a hidden message or hidden code in light. The biggest challenge was understanding what this meant. And in many ways, this discovery was the cornerstone behind modern astrophysics. Remember, the universe communicates with us using light. The wonderful thing about light is we can observe it from Earth. We don't have to travel to other stars and planets. So let's try and understand this language. So there are two main theories that detail the origin of our universe. One theory you're probably aware of called the Big Bang Theory, and the other one you're probably less aware of is called the Steady State Theory. The Big Bang Theory states that the universe, in other words, the energy and matter that make up the universe, was at one point compressed into a very small space. A huge explosion occurred, which we call the Big Bang, about 14 billion years ago. Ever since that explosion, the space in between this matter has been expanding. So you can see here, with every different image, we don't have more matter, but the space in between the matter is expanding. Think of it a bit like marbles resting on a tight light fabric, and you can stretch that elastic fabric so the space in between those marbles is getting greater. Now, because of this rate of expansion, we've been able to work out approximately how long ago the Big Bang happened. And as I say, about 14 billion years ago. However, this isn't perfectly accurate because we believe gravity, due to all the matter in the universe, has slowed the rate of expansion down over time. So the key points about the Big Bang theory is no new matter has been created and a huge explosion about 14 billion years ago has caused the space in between the matter to expand. The steady state theory assumes the universe exists now as it always has. The steady state theory assumes that space is expanding, but new matter forms in the gaps. The reason we considered this theory is because the universe appears the same in almost every direction. So you can see here that the universe is expanding, but in the gaps created, new matter appears. And that's how you compare the Big Bang and steady state theory. So now let's evaluate the evidence that supports each theory and decide which one's stronger or more compelling based on that evidence. Well, firstly, scientists have observed that light from other galaxies is red-shifted. I'll explain what that means in a bit. Now, this supports both the Big Bang and steady-state theory, and that's because both assume space is expanding. This will not make sense yet, but just wait. The second piece of evidence comes in the form of cosmic microwave background radiation, also known as CMB radiation, which is uniformly found in all directions. In other words, it's found everywhere. Now this only supports the Big Bang theory. 
And for this reason, we declare the Big Bang Theory the winner as it's supported by stronger evidence. So for your exams, this is probably the most important fact in terms of evaluating the evidence. Now I'm just going to go on to explain what these mean. So before we can understand the redshift idea, I think it's important to relate it to something we experience day to day. And for that, we're not going to look at light, but sound. If you remember, sound travels as a wave just like light. And the frequency at which sound travels at affects its properties. So here, where we have a longer wavelength and a lower frequency, we have a low pitch sound. And over here, where we have shorter wavelengths and higher frequencies, we have a high pitch sound. So imagine we have a car parked and the person's beeping their horn for some reason. Sound, as you expect, will be emitted as waves. These circles represent the crests of the wave, these points here. You can see they are equally spaced apart, so the pitch would be constant, as it's not changing to the lower end or the higher end. Now imagine the car starts to move and a dog starts to walk across the road and the car beeps its horn. Notice what happens to the sound waves. As the car approaches, the sound waves get bunched up near the front of the car. This is because the car is continually moving forward as it's emitting a sound. So by the time it emits the next wave, it's already moved closer to the wave ahead. So our dog will hear a higher pitch sound than say it would if the car was parked. As the car continues to move on, and it passes the dog, the car is constantly distancing itself from the previous wave, so the waves spread out. As a result, the dog will now hear a lower pitch sound because we're moving to this part of the sound spectrum or the audio spectrum. So this is why when a car passes you beeping its horn, you hear this. <coughs> the frequency of sound emitted from a moving object changes as it passes you. We call this the Doppler effect. But what has that got to do with stars and starlight? Well, the light spectrum works in exactly the same way, except for we don't talk about pitch, we talk about colour. So low frequencies of light are associated with the red end of the spectrum, and high frequencies of light with short wavelengths are associated with the blue end of the spectrum. So let's assume stars and galaxies in space weren't moving. Just like our parked car example, the light emitted from such sources would have a constant wavelength. In other words, the distance between each crest would be constant, the same. Now let's assume that these stars and galaxies were moving towards us. We'd have the same thing. The, basically, we'd bunch up those light waves as it moves closer to us, to Earth. And so the light would be shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum. So the light would be blue shifted. However, when we look into space, we do not observe this. Rather, we see this. The light from distant galaxies and stars is red shifted. So what we can infer from this, logically, is that galaxies and stars are moving away from us. What else would explain why light is shifted towards the red end of the spectrum? So through analysing starlight, we have come to the conclusion that the universe is expanding and galaxies are moving away from us, in fact from each other. You could pick any point in space and look at the galaxies surrounding you and they'll all appear as if they're moving away. But do not confuse this with the appearance of the star. It doesn't mean that the star will look red. I'll go into more detail on this a bit later. So now we have to look at how cosmic microwave background radiation is evidence for the Big Bang. When we examine space, we find there's microwave radiation everywhere, found in all directions. In fact, if you switch on a TV and you ever see this kind of staticky white noise image, your TV is actually receiving signals from this cosmic radiation. Now, what could have caused this radiation to be present everywhere? The most logical explanation is a huge explosion, which we now refer to as the Big Bang. So what your TV is actually doing is receiving signals from the Big Bang, which happened 14 billion years ago. Isn't that amazing? Something which looks so dull is telling us so much about the nature of our universe. But when it was initially released from the Big Bang, this radiation would have much higher frequency, much shorter wavelength for over 14 billion years. Space expands and cools, and the result is this radiation drops in frequency to the microwave part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So you can see here, much shorter wavelength here, longer, 14 billion years later. So you put two and two together. Universe is expanding, we know that. 
through Redshift. So it makes sense if you could film this sort of the timeline of our universe and rewind our uh, galactic video recorder, you could see all the galaxies moving back towards a central point in space. And also we've got all this radiation everywhere in the universe, which has most likely come about due to a huge explosion. This is why scientists believe in the Big Bang Theory. But remember the two most important points. Light from other galaxies is redshifted. This supports Big Bang and steady state, but only Big Bang is supported by cosmic microwave background radiation found everywhere. So now we can describe the evidence supporting each theory. So finally, let's really explain what is meant by redshift and what it really tells us about the universe. So if you remember at the start of this tutorial, I talked about hidden messages and light. Now we're going to really learn about what those messages tell us. This is definitely higher level. So firstly, you know through Newton's experiments that when you shine light through a prism, it splits up into its spectrum of colours. Each colour is characterised by having its own wavelength, with red light having the longest wavelength and violet light having the shortest. This affects their speed as they travel through the glass that makes up the prism. Red light travels faster and therefore bends less, violet light travels slower and bends more. This is what causes the separation of these colours. But this only works when travelling through an object with unparalleled sides like a prism or a raindrop. But where does this white light come from in the first place? The answer we can attribute to this very famous man here, Albert Einstein, who you may know for this equation here, E equals mc squared. But whether you know what that means is a different story. One of the most important things this equation tells us is E represents energy and m represents mass. So what it's quite simply telling us is energy can be converted into mass and mass can be converted into energy. In a star's core, where nuclear fusion is occurring, some of the mass of the hydrogen atoms that fuse together is converted to energy in the form of light. This is where white light comes from. So another logical question would be, if light is white, why doesn't everything look white? Why do we get things looking like different colours? Well, take these pen lids, for example. Each one of these pen lids will absorb the different wavelengths of light that make up white light. However, depending on the atoms they're made from, they will reflect certain wavelengths of light, and that determines their colour. So this pen lid here, this red one, will absorb all the wavelengths of light, but reflect the red part of the spectrum. The blue one will absorb all the wavelengths of light except for the blue part of the spectrum which it reflects. But what's going on at an atomic level? Well, the world of an atom is truly bizarre. And it's very hard to relate to it in terms of common sense or experience because we just don't experience anything like this on a day-to-day -day basis. As you probably know by now, an atom consists of a nucleus in the middle and it has shells or energy levels around it where electrons basically orbit the nucleus. Now, you probably think or assume that these electrons continue around their orbit in a perfect little circle when actually they do very bizarre things. They teleport, they can leap from one level to another level, back to another level and join and then leap and teleport. Basically they do things that defy human experience. Now I'm just gonna pause this electron moving for a second so we can understand what it's doing. So imagine a photon of light basically comes in and is absorbed by that electron. That electron gains energy and suddenly jumps up to a higher energy level. After a while, it loses its energy and returns back to its lower energy level. When it does this, it emits a photon of light. The wavelength it releases depends or relates directly to the difference in energy between the two levels. So because different atoms have different number of energy levels and because they have different number of electrons and so on, they will emit different photons of light with different wavelengths and therefore they will appear different colour when perceived by our eye. So this, for example, is the light that hydrogen atoms emit. This is basically a high voltage current which is heating up an hydrogen atmosphere. The hydrogen atoms are getting excited, the electrons are jumping up to higher energy states than returning and as they return they emit photons of light that appear like this. But that's just hydrogen. Different elements will emit different wavelengths of light and therefore appear to look different in colour. And you can see this very easily experimentally by conducting flame tests which you probably have done in a lab. In this example I'm heating copper particles. Look what happens. You can see that the light will turn green. So copper particles, or copper ions in this case, will emit green light. 
whereas below you can see calcium emits a sort of orangey light. So all I'm doing is heating these metal particles up and their electrons are getting excited, jumping up to high energy states and returning and emitting photons of light with a specific wavelength. So different types of atoms or elements emit different wavelengths of light. But how is this related to stars? Well, if we do what Joseph von Fraunhofer did, which is look at starlight using a diffraction grating, suddenly we see something very interesting. This is what the spectrum emitted from our sun looks like. You'll notice the visible spectrum as you know it, but there are bits missing, blanked out. What's causing this? What we're essentially looking at here is hydrogen's specific signature. Only the element hydrogen leaves marks in these positions, in this order. So we can tell that our sun is making hydrogen. And therefore we know it's in its main sequence star stage if you'd watched the tutorial on star life cycles. But why is this happening? Well, remember nuclear fusion produces white light, which I've drawn using this yellow arrow here. Now the sun's atmosphere is crammed with hydrogen atoms everywhere. Now as those hydrogen atoms absorb white light and the electrons get excited, when they return back down to their lower energy state, they emit certain wavelengths of light. But rather than emitting them in a straight line back towards us, they scatter them randomly in all directions. So you can see the scattering over here. These are the wavelengths of light that hydrogen atoms re-emit. This is called the emission spectrum. And if you were to burn hydrogen in a lab and look at it through a diffraction grating, this is what you would see. However, when you look at the light from the sun using a diffraction grating, this is what you see. You see white light in its all its glory, but the light that's been scattered and therefore doesn't reach us, you just see a dark line. So remember, an absorption spectrum shows you the light that the atoms or elements have absorbed, and an emission spectrum tells you the light they scatter once they've absorbed it and re-emit it. Also remember, scattered light doesn't travel very far. That's why we don't see it when we're looking at the sun through a diffraction grating. And here you can see the emission spectra of different elements. So you can see helium, mercury, nitrogen, neon, oxygen, sodium. Each one is characterized by its specific spectral signature. So quite simply, by analyzing the light that a star outputs, we can tell exactly what that star is making and also assume what stage it is in its star life cycle just by looking at the light. So what have we learned from studying absorption and emission spectra? Well, firstly, the elements made by specific stars and therefore their approximate age. Secondly, we've worked out that the universe is expanding and all galaxies are moving away from each other. And thirdly, and do take note of this point because it does come up in exams, distant galaxies are moving away faster. But I haven't explained that. Take a look at this. Here we're looking at the light from three different stars. The first one's the sun, which is closest to us, then a distant star, then a very distant star down here. Compare the patterns you see in the spectra below. You can see that they have the same absorption spectra, in other words, the same black lines, the same distance from each other. But the more distance the source of light is from us, the more red shifted are the line spectra. So the slightly distant star has a slight shift towards the red end of the spectrum, whereas distant star two, which is really far away, has an even more exaggerated shift towards the red end of the spectrum. What would explain the difference in the degree of shift? Well, firstly, we can definitely assume that all these stars are producing hydrogen because of their pattern. But we can also assume that this star is moving away from us at a faster rate. That's why there's a greater degree of red shift. So in some exams, they will give you a series of line spectra to analyze. The key thing to remember is the more red shifted starlight is, firstly, that star or galaxy must be further away from you. And secondly, it must be moving away at a faster rate. So that is how scientists use spectrometry, the analysis of line spectra, to learn about the universe.